I'm going to talk about uh, GNU Linux tuning for MongoDB. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it from the OS and sysadmin perspective, uh, as opposed to from a DBA perspective. Um, I have been working with DBAs on this, and they mostly agree with what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, no, they, they like what, I, what I've got in here. Um, but uh, I'm going to describe things from a different perspective than a DBA's perspective. All right? So if you, if you feel that I'm just not quite getting it right, we can talk about it afterwards, but let us, con let us continue on. Uh, I am a customer data engineer for Object Rocket, doing database support, uh, and we are hiring. Uh, we're a Rackspace company, so the URL I gave you is actually for Rackspace, and that's for our remote work. Um, if we have an office here in town or wherever you're at, uh, we actually, they changed policy recently, so you need to go into the office if you're near one, um, and we have positions open all over the place, but we also have some of their specific work where you are, uh, which is what I do. I'm a, I work remotely. Uh, upcoming presentations, I often get questions about this, uh, so I put them up here. You can get to, get to see most of those from my website. Um, next week, I'll be talking about space, we'll have a space night panel uh, with some JPL people, uh, MassCam, and some other cool projects um, if you're going to be in the Phoenix area. Uh, the Linux Fest Northwest and Texas Linux Fest, they've both accepted talks, but conferences are canceling right and left right now, so I have no idea if those, those are actually going to take place. Uh, and I've only bought ticket, uh, airline flight for one of them, so you know, I might only be out half of as much money. Uh, we'll see. Uh, and then uh, the, URL, the CR, QR code is leading to that URL where I end up po posting my talks. Uh, these slides will go up there as well. All right. We got photo opportunity. That same QR code is on the uh, paper. All right. Uh, social media, ways to get a hold of me. Uh, so I've got, I use Mastodon, uh, it's one of, actually the talk that was accepted for both of the other conferences was on the Fediverse uh, and Plume, and then I'm on IRC, uh, I'm slow to respond, but I'm there all the time, all right? Um, now, I like conferences like this where you have a variety of things, and sometimes I see a talk that is related to uh, what I'm going to be giving. Uh, I try to go to that talk myself and learn. Uh, and in this case, I did get to go to Ilya's uh, talk on Thursday. Uh, it was a very good talk. He's coming at it from a different perspective. But we're still talking about uh, uh, going through and, and optimizing your system for a database. Postgres is different than MongoDB, but a lot of things go in. And he gets into the details of actually how the Linux, how the, the stack works. I'm not going to get into, the, into those details. Um, so if you're interested in that, I do recommend his talk. It was, it was uh, very good. So first of all, what is MongoDB? So MongoDB is a document-based database. So it's not holding records and stuff. It, it, well, it is holding records, but they're, they're, we, we think of them as a document. Um, one thing we, we hear a lot for the NoSQL stuff is that it's schemaless. It is not schemaless. It just has a very flexible schema, right? Um, so when you're, when you're creating databases and you're creating documents to go into them, you still need to think about what you're doing, right? If you change your mind on what you're going to call the name every time you put in a new document, there are going to be different fields, right? If you do name and then first name and then last name and, and uh, you know, name in Norwegian, whatever the, the word for that is, right? Uh, then those are going to appear as different fields. So you still need to think about that so your, your documents are cohesive. Um, but it also means, the way we're, we're storing things, that every single item has, a, has the, the uh, field name with it. So when you store Bob Smith as name, in the record it has name and Bob Smith. So you're taking up a little bit extra space that way. Actually, a lot in the end, but it's, it's worth it for a lot of reasons. Um, and so you, so you do have to think about your schema and make some plans on it, but it's very adaptive. So if, if it becomes important to start putting in whether or not they've had COVID-19, you could just add that field by starting to add it to documents, right? Um, and then we use replica sets. And the replica sets means that for every data, piece of data that you enter, you're actually getting three copies of it. Um, you don't have to do three copies. I'm going to ignore that. If you care about optimization, if you care about how well your database is running for MongoDB, you should have three copies of all your data. <laughs> how it is, right? Some key benefits, you get data redundancy. You get three copies, right? So if you lose a server, you've got two more that are ready. 
Hopefully you've got also built out an infrastructure where you can replace that server or give it time to recover. Uh, and then you have horizontal scale, and we'll talk about that, where you can go through and build out sideways instead of having to just get bigger and bigger machines. Uh, some presumptions for my presentation. You're going to have dedicated systems. You're not running MongoDB and LDAP and a mail server and, and, a, and a, you know, whatever else all in the same box. All the boxes you're going to be running on are dedicated to just running MongoDB and whatever services MongoDB needs uh, on those boxes. Uh, and then I'm going to stick with replica sets and sharded clusters. Uh, there are a couple of other configurations you can do, and there's a couple other pieces, but I'm going to mostly ignore those uh, because they don't... Uh, if you're running single, just a single box with MongoDB on it, you're, again, you're, you're not, you don't care about performance too terribly much, is in, my, in my view. So what is a replica set? It is three or more MongoD, uh, and I'll, ex I'll ex cover what MongoD is in a little bit. Um, so your replica set by default, you need to have a primary and two secondaries, um, but you can add more secondaries. Uh, now if you're a DBA, you need to start, start worrying about how you're adding secondaries because they have to vote to say who's the primary, and votes can take place at any time. So if you have four boxes, that causes problems. So you read the documentation if you're needing to do that, um, but most likely your DBA should be taking care of that part of it. We're going to be talking about things under that. Uh, each, of this, each of those MongoDs has a copy of the data for which they are, are uh, responsible in a replica set. That's the entire thing. Uh, the one primary takes the rights. So if you need to scale with just a replica set, you're doing vertical scaling, just like you would be doing with, with MySQL or Postgres in a, in a normal non-clustered environment. Um, so you want to write more in a replica set? Get a bigger box, right? Uh, and then you can, but you can read from your secondaries. So you can scale out a little bit that way. Uh, and that's one of the places where you can add a whole bunch of extra secondaries. If it turns out you're doing tons of reads, you can, you can read off those secondaries. Application developers and DBAs need to worry about that to make sure that the data is on the secondaries when they try to read them, but that's outside the scope of the talk. Uh, and then you can have a sharded cluster. Uh, this first line is one of the places where DBAs will, will be like, no, that's not but it's pretty close. <laughs> so a sharded cluster is like a bunch of replica sets because that's kind of really what it is. What you're doing is you're saying, here's my, my data that I've got. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to separate it in different ways and put part of it on one, on one set and part of it on another set and part of it on another set. And the, each of those sets is essentially a replica set. And so if you think about you know, the standard A through Z, right? So we could just say, okay, I'm going to put 26 replica sets together and put one letter on each of those things, right? It's not a really good way because your MOOCs will just destroy that database, but you know, that, that's a, a, a simple way of understanding how it's going through. But I could also shard and put the MOOCs and the max and the stuff on their own shards and stuff as well. Uh, each shard has a portion of the data, right? So you'd have, in, in my example, you'd have one that ha a shard that has A's and one a shard that has B's and a shard that has C's and so forth. And then you put proxies in front of those. Those are Mongo S. We'll talk about those in, in a second. And those route the queries to each of the, the shards. So you get a query in that says, hey, look for all the people that have cats, that have zebra stripes, that, that have, but their names start with A through C. So it would go talk to the A, B, and C shard servers and go look for people that have cats with zebra stripes. Right? Um, but shards can be hotspots. So like I say, if you just did the A through Z thing, especially in Scotland or in Ireland, right, you'd get a lot of MOOCs in there and your M server would be a really hot spot because you would get, be getting a, a, a lot of, of stuff in there. And most likely your Z server will be getting very little traffic unless, you've, unless you're doing the Zappa family tree or something like that, right? Um, and then your queries might or might not hit each shard. My example for A through C then it's only going to hit those three shards. It's not going to hit the rest of the, the other 23 shards. So the MongoD or your data servers, those are doing the, the heavy work for writing data to, to disk and doing the queries and, 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 and comparisons and so forth. And then your Mongos are your proxies that sit out front in a, in a sharded server or sharded cluster. Uh, as I say, MongoD is your, your data server. You get a lot of TCP connections because they're talking to each other all the time and they're talking to all the Mongos. It's not 
huge amount of, of TCP connections, but there's still quite a few of them. Um, you get lots of network I.O., right? That's why you have the database, so you can throw data back and forth. That's your MongoDs are going to be doing that. Uh, and they also balance, so they'll move things around on their own. So there's some other things that go on that, that take place with the, the MongoD that we don't participate in too terribly much. Lots of disk I.O. That's the point of it. You're putting data on there. And if you're in a sharded environment, you, it means you've got a decent amount of data and you want a, you know replication and so forth. Um, one thing that's kind of cool about it is when you start MongoD from the command line, it will check certain things. And if it finds something that it thinks is suboptimal, it will let you know. So we run a Mongo uh, D on OpenVZ and, and a MongoDB is not, doesn't think that's a good idea. So every time we start MongoD, it comes up and goes, oh, we detected your own OpenVZ. That's not really a good idea. It's working well. It's just something that they haven't done. We've done a little extensive testing. It's working great for us, right? Um, but it'll come up. And if it says, hey, I wanted memory and you forgot to install some RAM, you know, it'll, it'll come up and give you some warnings. Um, so if you're a system in maintaining a MongoDB system, the main thing with the, the helpful warnings is keep an eye out for them. Figure out which ones you are or aren't expecting. You know, so, if, so if you see something, ask the DBAs and go, hey, by the way, I noticed we got this warning, right? One of the first things I did when I first started the job, I said, why are we getting this warning about OpenVZ? And they said, no, no, we're good, you know, and, and explain what we're doing. So your Mongos are proxies. So they're taking queries from the application and then, then passing those on to the appropriate shards, the appropriate, appropriate nodes. So if it's a read query, it might send it to all three nodes in the shard, or if you've got 10 nodes in the shard for some reason, it might send it to all 10 nodes. If it's a write query, it's going to send it to the primary, right? Uh, it'll also be tracking which one is the primary and things like that, so it sends it to the right node. Uh, it is the TL TLS endpoint connection for application servers. So whatever your application developers have created, that's, they're going to be talking to the Mongos. Uh, and I say the Mongos plural, even though it's kind of, it's hard to tell in the name. So you can, you can, you can horizontally scale your Mongos, so you can have multiples. Uh, we have multiple customers that have uh, 30 plus Mongos in their uh, infrastructure that we've set up for them. Uh, you get uh, lots of TCP connections, not the same as a web server, but you still have a lot of TCP connections uh, and more than what the default settings for most Linux distributions will give you. So we'll be upping those up a, a little bit. Uh, lots of network I.O. They're taking data in from the MongoDs and then spitting it back out to the application servers. If you're writing data, they're taking data from the application servers and passing it on to the MongoDs. So they're doing a lot of data pass through. Uh, they don't do a lot of disk I.O. because you, you want them moving fast. Just Network stack to network stack. Uh, as I mentioned, there's some other servers. Uh, you've got config servers in uh, MongoDB uh, 4.0. Um, and you also have Arbiter. Don't run an Arbiter if you care about performance. Um, that, that means you have one less replica. Uh, but neither one of them really gets appreciable load. And Arbiter is just going, are you two alive? Are you two alive? Are you two alive? It's, it's not doing much. Um, and the config servers are, are getting very little use. So you don't have to worry about uh, um, performance on those so much. Just make sure that they're, if you're using them, they're on reliable systems, right? Don't put them on a Raspberry Pi in the kid's closet. But <laughs> put them on something, you know, right, right next to the, the box of cat toys. Not a good place to put those, all right? Um, app servers. So this is for your application, right? So you're going to have lots of TCP connections going from the app servers to the Mongos. Uh, whether that be the, be the Mongo S or the Mongo Ds, depending on if you're uh, sharded uh, clusters or uh, replica, replica set. Um, so lots of network I.O. You've got tons of connections opening and closing all the time. You've got a lot of data passing back and forth. And then whatever your application load is, right? Whatever your application is doing, whatever it needs performance for. I'm not going to talk about that because I don't know what your application is doing. Um, but it is, as a sysadmin, one of those things to keep in mind. Uh, we have run into some customers that for I don't want to say forget that aspect, but don't plan adequately uh, so their application can't handle the load of what they're trying to do with our service. Uh, so MongoD tuning. Uh, so one, set the soft and hard limits the same in ULimit. Just go through. Uh, we want to open up 
uh, increase the, the, the resources for processes and threads and for open files. Uh, MongoD opens a file for uh, FD, you know, file descriptor for every database file that it's opening, and it's opening more database files than you know because it's doing a bunch of stuff underneath for you. Um, so you want to increase those. Um, you might find you need more, but these, the, we, from what I can see around the industry, these seem to be pretty good numbers in most cases. Um, uh, but for CPU time, uh, memory, and file size and all that, just max those out. Just, it's MongoDB's box. Let it do what it wants to do with MongoDB, with the, the box. Do you want, you want your database to, fi to fail because, oh, it needed to create a, a file that was bigger than you were allowing? Um, no, we don't want to do that. It want, you want it to have all of the memory. That's the purpose of the box, right? If, if the oom thing comes in, please kill off <laughs> something, something minor. Don't kill off the MongoD, right? Uh, so we want to max those out. Uh, for, for tuning, uh, now this is the swappiness thing is actually kind of a new thing as of you know, a few years ago, but it's, it's still around. So it used to be for databases, we said set the swappiness to zero because what we want, swappiness is how much does the kernel aggressively try to keep from swapping data to disk. Database, we don't want using the swap partition. We want to keep the data in, in memory. If you have to swap something, swap something else, right? Um, but a, a few years ago, uh, the uh, kernel team changed what the behavior for swappiness equals zero does and it's bad for databases. Um, so, and, it, and Red Hat backported it, so you can't even look at the kernel version to find out which version has it. So, swappiness one is almost do as little swapping as you can at, at the worst case. So set swappiness to one so that we reduce the amount of swapping that the system's gonna do. Now, dirty ratio and dirty background ratio, uh, we want to reduce those down so we, we are writing data disk. We don't want to risk losing it. If you are using battery backed disk and some other things in there, you might, might, might not need, need to matter or worry about that so much. Uh, in Ilya's Postgres talk, he said if you're using SSD, you might actually want to increase those. But in general, in the Mongo world, where we recommend running on SSD, we're still generally recommending drop those off. But I, you know, I, you know so go look, go look at those. Uh, MongoDB does not handle NUMA. So you need to disable Mon uh, NUMA. Um, yeah. It's one of those errors that you're talking about. It actually says, hey, enable it when you have a NUMA machine. Does it? Yeah. Interesting. I'll have to go try that. Huh. So that, that's one of the errors you were talking about at the beginning. It'll yeah. Tell her, you hit, yeah. If you have it on, it'll tell you. Okay. Or if you have it on, it'll tell you to disable it. Uh huh. And it wants it to be installed. Huh. I'll have to do some experimentation with that. Okay. All of their documentation says disable this thing and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Yeah. Because Mongo says to. Okay. To All right. So, research, right? Don't, don't, don't take what the long haired freaky dude says <laughs> <laughs> as, as real. But yeah, so anything we talk about. Um, so, interesting. I'll have to do some experimentation with that as well. Cool. Um, IRQ balance, <laughs> I, I didn't even remember that existed. <laughs> but yeah, our DBAs like turn that on for your, for your MongoDs. Um, and what IRQ balance does is if you get multiple cores in, in MongoDB, we're, we're, I'll tell you three or four times here and during the talk, more cores is better than faster cores. So you want to have a ton of, core, uh, of CPU cores. And uh, you want to make sure your IQs are balancing across those so that you don't have something that's just constantly interrupting one CPU and then anything else that uses that CPU gets locked up because it's, it keeps handling IRQs. Uh, and then also test to make sure your IRQ balance is, is working. Uh, proc interrupts will give you that. Uh, and then um, huge pages is fine, but, but uh, Red Hat, uh, so the, the transparent huge pages is something where it tries to go through and be smart for you and do, do some huge page stuff. Uh, that doesn't work out well for, for MongoDB, and it's been around for a while, um, but at some point, Red Hat started enabling that by default. So if you're on RHEL or CentOS, uh, you need to go disable that. You, probably on Fedora too, but you probably should be running MongoDB on Fedora. All right. Um, so make sure to disable that. 
So read ahead. So what read ahead gives you is if you have a lot of random, or if you have a lot of sequential I.O. So like you go, you go read a video file off your, off your disk, you might be reading three gigs of continu contiguous disk space, right? So it, what read ahead says is when you go look for this particular location of, of data off the disk, go get the next couple locations as well, the ones that are right next to it. But MongoDB is doing mostly random I.O. So I say, go get this one thing, and it goes and gets three things. I'm like, I didn't need the other two things, right? You, know, you send the three-year-old to go, to go get the mayonnaise for you, and they come back with pickles and, and, and ketchup. You're like, no, we just needed the mayonnaise, right? So, and then you got to go put those back or hide them while nobody's looking, whatever you know, your uh, mechanism is. Um, so we want to uh, turn that down uh, so that we don't pick up the extra stuff. Uh, also, isolate your MongoDB data directory. So we're doing a lot of I.O. on that. So isolation doesn't mean just make it a different directory. That's, it's going to be that by default. Put it on different disks, right? So different spindles or different SSDs, hopefully instead of spindles at this point. Um, and uh, journaling. So you also have logs and journaling that will take place with MongoDB. If you can afford it, uh, put those on different uh, uh, disks as well. So set, isolate those. And I'll talk uh, as a sysadmin, working, I mean, I'm, I'm working as a DBA, but I'm still a sysadmin. It's just who I am. And as a sysadmin, the, the logging for MongoDB has been my, my, the bane of my sysadmin existence, and we'll get to that. Uh, for a scheduler, uh, use deadline uh, for uh, uh, bare metal. Uh, and no-op for virtualization. We'll talk, cover that a little bit. Uh, now, Ilya was saying to use no-op for SSDs as well. Uh, my DBAs were using SSDs, and we're, all, we're still using Deadline. We're happy with it. Uh, but Ilya gave, me some, gave some really good examples of why Deadline isn't, isn't a great choice for database stuff. Uh, so I'm going to take that five minutes of his talk and put it in front of my DBAs and go, hey, guys, let's talk about this, right? Um, you know, that's what I love about conferences like this. We can learn, we're going to get absorb new stuff. Um, but in, in industry, MongoDB is saying use deadline for bare metal. Uh, or bare silicon, I guess. I don't know, whatever. Uh, journaling is required as of MongoDB 4.0. So as a sysadmin, if you're, if you're upgrading, if your DBAs are upgrading from 3.2 or 3.6, um, you'll see that as a new requirement coming into your system. Uh, and make sure you've planned your, your host's for that as well. And like I say, especially if you can go through and move that to a different uh, set of disks than your primary DB database. Uh, file system. So MongoDB says, all their documentation everywhere says, XFS is required for Wired Tiger, Wired Tiger uh, which is generally the preferred uh, mechanism at this point. Um, and they prefer XFS for MMAP, uh, but you could use X EXT4 if you want. Now, we're actually using EXT4 because most of our systems have, have upgraded from MMAP to, uh, you know, to whatever to up to, 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 to 4 and, and using Wire Tiger and stuff. Uh, and our DBAs are really happy with EXT4. It's doing what we need. The big thing is it needs, uh, the file system needs F-Sync. So there's a, quite a few de uh, uh, file systems that won't work because uh, when MongoDB writes something to disk, it wants it to be written to disk instead of, you know, maybe someday eventually, right? <laughs> um, a time. So mostly for databases and lots of other things, they say right, suggest getting rid of or uh, disabling a time. An a time is the access time. So every time you access a file, the, the system goes and updates the a time on, for that file on the file system. So if you do find slash, it's going through and updating the A time on every file on your file on your system, right? But a few years ago, as in like ten, <laughs> but I didn't know about this. They set a uh, a, a, a fuzzy A time uh, mechanism, which is now the default. And there's a whole bunch of rules that go into it, and it, and it involves playing Jenga at some point, I think. Um, but basically, it says if we haven't updated the A time for a while and you touched it, and, or you looked at it, and you did these things, then we'll update the A time. But if you've updated it recently, that was good enough. Um, so that, you know, if you were, like, uh, uh, checking uh, a file 50 times a second previously, you know, using the old A time setup, you're updating that file, that the, the, the file descriptor, 50 times a second, 
right? And there's a whole bunch of writes for no particular reason. So they use this fuzzy thing. Um, but you could just turn off a time altogether, which is the no a time uh, solution as well. Um, so they recommend uh, RAID 10. It's fast, and you've got redundancy. We like RAID 0. You've got redundancy because you've got multiple copies, right? And, and so we can get faster than RAID 10 and not have to have the, the extra disk and stuff. And we do a bunch of other things to make sure we have redundancy and, and stability in our network, uh, in our infrastructure. Um, so depends on what your risk is and, and how you want to look at that. If you're going to use NFS for your file store, uh, you need to turn on BG, no, no lock, and no A time. You definitely need to turn on no A time for NFS instead of using the default. Uh, again, uh, data partition. Have a, have a different partition for data where you've got different disks that your, your data is going into. Now we're going to get to my favorite subject, logs. So plan for log floods. MongoDB really gets into the are we there yet. So when you have one of your nodes go down, all the other nodes are like, I can't find the node, I can't find the node, I can't find the node. Gigs a minute of, I can't find the node. Seriously, it's hundreds and hundreds of the same line every second. And so if you've got, you know, like we have an infrastructure where we're not putting that much in VAR because that's not where the data is, you run out of space. And that's not so awesome. And granted, I mean, you stop writing the thing you don't really care about because you know the node's down. You don't <laughs> need all this. However, as a system in, you want to plan for that um, so that you can have the, the data that you do want to have. Um, and I, don't, I haven't found anybody that knows how to just turn that thing off and say, just tell me once in a while, like, you know, just 40 times a second. <laughs> yeah, that would be sufficient. Um, so that's there. Uh, and especially if you've got, uh, if, if, if big queries is what caused the, the, the node to go down or bad query, it'd be nice to have the log so you can see what it is that caused the problem, right? Um, so plan for, uh, you know, log rotation. So go through and rotate your logs pretty often so you're compressing them. Uh, plan for circular logs is another way of doing that or truncation or something like that. Offload them to a centralized log server so you don't have them on the box themselves, right? So different things like that. Um, but other than that, it's really not that bad. Uh, but you will, uh, if you don't do something, you will run out of space in VAR at some point. Uh, so network tuning. <laughs> So we want to increase the, the, uh, um, the, the connections for uh, um, the backlog and allowing TCP connections. Um, but we want to reduce the, the times for the keep alives. In most cases, we have, a, we have uh, uh, an infrastructure where we've actually kind of done the opposite um, because we have a uh, customer that is just large enough that when they start flooding us, if we haven't kept connections alive to just keep it warm, we start running out of TCP connections and, and overloading our Mongos, even though they're talking to, like I say, at least 30 Mongos. I don't remember how many they have, but they, they've got at least 30 Mongos that they're, they're separating their stuff across. But when they hit us, it's a flood. And so we go through and actually actively keep our, our, keep, uh, our connections alive. So we've got those ready, right? Um, so look at that. Uh, and then another one is the IP connect tract. Uh, if you are firewall, we'll get to firewalling in a little bit, uh, but if you are firewalling and somehow tracking connections, make sure you increase that. You will run out of uh, uh, space in your firewall tables. All right. CPU. As I mentioned, more cores are better than faster cores in general. Right? Test your particular load, and for everything I'm saying, test your particular load. Go through and do research on your own as well. But you know, um, in general, you want more cores. You want to spread out the stuff. MongoDB does a good job of being able to use multiple cores uh, and, and isolate uh, stuff. Turn off dynamic speed in your BIOS and OS. Uh, you don't want your CPUs slowing down. Just you're going to pay for full speed on the on the CPUs. Uh, if you've got a workload where really you only use it, you know, like for two hours a day or something like that, okay, maybe figure out a way to let them spin down for 22 hours and then warm up the database before that window comes up or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, you want the CPUs to be going full out all the time so that when the load hits, you're already up and running. Um, 
if you're using encryption, which should be yes, please, uh, MongoDB does point out that the AES-NI extension for CPUs gives performance uh, improvements for encryption, so you'll be able to move some of that load to silicon. That is, I believe, Mongo's encryption. So, um, and then, as I said, SSD is preferred. You can work on spinning disks. You know, uh, we don't have any. I don't think we have any of that left in our infrastructure. Um, but the last company I was at that was using MongoDB was a couple companies ago. We had all our stuff on spinning disks, and we're doing some pretty amazing things. The, the Mongo team was doing some pretty amazing things with it. Um, but you know, SSD is getting cheaper and cheaper and, and, and stuff, so uh, use that if you can. Uh, databases care about time, right? Not that they're, they don't need, they don't even necessarily care about the correct time. I mean, your application might. <laughs> so when you store now, if now it says 1964, that might not be what they were thinking of. Um, but all the nodes care about being at the, on the same time. So you want to make sure that all of your Mongo nodes are running NTPD, uh, whether that be, you know, if you're in virtualization, you might be running on that, that on the host and just making sure your, your containers or VMs are, are being synced that way. Um, but you want to be running NTP of some sort and making sure that they're all connecting to the same uh, uh, time server infrastructure, right? So maybe run, your, run NTPDs on a couple of your uh, routers inside your infrastructure, make sure they're going up to the same place. Um, but keep all those nodes on the same time. It actually will take a decent amount of skew, um, but let's, let, you know, better to avoid that. Uh, MongoD2, uh, so uh, configurations. So this, we're getting actually into DBA space a little bit on this, but I thought, it, you know, system ends, it was good to, to bring up a couple of these things. Um, so MongoDB will do compression on those documents that it's storing on disk for you. Um, Snappy has been the, the, the go-to. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a, a what is it, um, GZ uh, encryption uh, available as well, um, but it uses a lot of CPU. It doesn't really give you the benefit. So Snappy has been kind of the default that we've been using, which is their own internal encryption. But as of 4.2, they've added ZSTD. Um, and they're recommending that you get better compression than Snappy. Does a little bit, use a little bit more CPU. So again, depends on what your workload is. Um, but it is is working out to be a better uh, encryption uh, compression mechanism, algorithm. Um, How much is a little more? I haven't done any. I haven't done any personal testing, um, so I I can't give you that. Yeah, and it, it depends on the workload, right? So it, if you are uh, storing a whole bunch of logs in MongoDB where it's all the same, then you're going to have um, uh, really good compression on that. And a little bit of compression might not matter that much because everything's going to give you pretty good compression. But if you are storing the name of everybody on the planet and all their localized languages, that might not compress as well. I don't know. Probably still does because you still got millions or billions in each language, but you know, in each area. Uh, and then they do, MongoDB does index compression. And this is one of the main reasons I wanted to put in here. There's two different things, right? So the first one is storing the documents that I was talking about. So that when you store the document on disk, MongoDB can go through and do compression on that. It does by default uh, index compression. So index is, you know, like any other database where we've got it built a table, so it makes it quick uh, a way to, to go through and look at it using your, your shard key and, and whatever else, or whatever you've told it to, to do index on. It's not necessar necessarily the shard key. Um, but you end up with the first part of all of those entries being the same, right? So uh, to, there's portions of them being the same and so forth. So it goes through and does some, uh, you know, hey, this is, this is all the A's compression mechanism, all the B's and so forth. So it does some, some uh, um, specific compression on the indexes. Does that by, uh, by default, uh, and, that, and the, those can then remain compressed in RAM because it's actually it's, it's comparing on a signature versus actually comparing on the actual value. So it's, it, for, from a system in perspective, it's like it's saying it's taking hashes of all those and then comparing the hashes instead of comparing the actual value. It's not what it's doing, but along those lines. Uh, now, Mongos. Um, 
we want to get uh, user processes again. We want to max those things out. Uh, oh, this is a slide I should have I, that, that I meant to delete. So sorry about that. We'll move on. Uh, this this uh, formula I have on the bottom isn't quite correct, but the main thing I was pointing out, trying to point out with this, is that you end up with multiple connections for each shard because you're talking to each node within the shard. Uh, and then it also does a minimum number of connections per shard, so you end up with with multiples and multiples and multiples. Still nothing compared like to the web server, but uh, more than just go, oh, I've got 50 application servers and 40 shards, and it, there's a bit more to it than that. Um, so for the U limit, uh, set start, hard, soft and hard limits the same again. Uh, this is essentially the same information we had for MongoD where we want to have, uh, uh, we need more processes and threads and open files than you get by default. And then again, the Mongoose box should be running Mongoose and whatever Mongoose needs in order to continue running. So give it all the memory, give it all the resources on that, on that system. Uh, network, uh, again, we want to increase the values on uh, TCP connections, reduce the, the keep alives. This is the place where we did the opposite for that one customer. We kept keep alive so we would keep connections around longer. Uh, but normally you want to reduce those uh, and then again adjust the connect tract uh, value if you're doing uh, firewalling and so forth. Um, on the Mongos, even more than the MongoD, you want to you want to open the gates for the for the networking stuff because they're taking they're talking to every MongoD node, they're talking to each other, they're talking to all the application servers, they're sending gossip. No, they're not they doing that. But they are they are talking to a lot more boxes and they're throwing data back and forth. So you want to make sure that they're uh, in good shape on the network. Again, more cores is better than faster cores. Not as much for the Mongo as the MongoDs, but even on the Mongos, that, that's important. And again, turn off the dynamic speed. We, the, the purpose of this box is to, to do stuff. Let's make sure the CPU is there available. Uh, and again, uh, encryption. NTPD, we want to make sure your time's good in all of them. Do that. Hold on a second. I forgot to, forgot to do something earlier. All right. Uh, virtualization. Uh, one thing that's important, it's important for MongoDB in general, um, but especially in virtualization, you need rack awareness. If you put all three nodes of a shard on the same host server and that host server goes away, you got no shard, <laughs> right? You need them to be on different host servers, but also you want to have them on different racks. So if you lose a rack, you don't lose all of your shards, right? So you need, you want to want you're especially in a virtualization environment to make sure you've got some rack awareness and keep those things physically isolated as well. Um, storage, choose reliable fast storage options. So with some of the, the cloud providers, uh, you can get uh, less expensive storage that is, it, it's along the CPU thing, right? Where it's not running full speed all the time and you, you end up with a little bit of ramp up time and when you start moving a lot of data, it's a database. It wants to be able to talk to disk as fast as possible. So you want to choose uh, storage and networking options that just give it to you full stream uh, all the time, right? And it, the other services, there's value for that, for the, I don't want to call it, redu it's kind of a reduced uh, uh, capability storage. It's not, not saying that in a negative way. For lots of ab other applications, that's fine. Save the money, right? But for uh, database stuff, you want to have you want to have uh, the full full throttle, uh, and then uh, lots of virtualization does memory over commitment, and this is this is if you're a system in go research this because it's actually really important for us to understand that I, I don't have time to really get into it, um, but basically when when it, your application says hey I need a bunch of memory, the kernel says sure here you go, and doesn't actually do anything it just says you've got it. And then later on, if, you're, if your application starts using the memory, the kernel's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll actually go get you some, right? Um, and part of the reason for that is if you, like, have a, a large process and it forks, technically, it has a, that fork has a copy of all the memory that the original process had. And if it's just forking so it can do something small and then die, it's... it's you don't need to go and say, oh, let's go allocate 36 gigs of memory for this process that's about to, to extinguish itself. 
So by not allocating that memory, the kernel is saving a lot of work, and you 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 can do a lot more on the system by by uh, uh, you know uh, uh, not uh, having to have enough RAM for everything that that forks and stuff like that. Um, but for databases, we, when, when the database says, give me memory, we want to have the memory. Uh, and we don't want it, uh, to run, the system to run out just because it said, oh, yeah, you can have some, and you can have some, and you can have some. And then all those things come in and want their memory, and there's not enough space, right? Um, if, you know, the, uh, the airline thing, right? So they got 200 seats on the flight. They sell 230 because they presume that 30 people aren't going to show up, or they can kick them into the next plane or something like that, right? But if you're doing corporate travel and you need your 200 people to show up so they can do whatever it is before the CEO gets there, you want the 200 seats. <laughs> Don't say, we want all 200 seats. Don't sell 30 more. Those 200 are ours. Get us there, right? So similar type of thing. KVM and OpenVZ do open uh, overcommitment. Oh, I forgot to mention here. Uh, so map and reserve the memory. So don't disable overcommitment. That actually causes some other issues with the operating system. Um, but what you can do is go through and map and reserve all that memory so that you have it. Like the, the airline example, those 200 seats are ours. Don't sell 30 more, right? We can, we can go through and do that. Uh, so KVM and OpenVZ uh, handle the, uh, the memory overcommitment. For AWS, um, this is one of the places where you want to get the enhanced networking instead of their standard networking. Uh, and again, not to say there's something wrong with the standard networking, just we want the, the, the premium stuff. Um, make sure you've got, you, you sign up for provisioning IOPS uh, and don't use d uh, ephemeral IOPS. Database is there to do stuff. Uh, disable DVFS and CPU power saving modes. So we want the CPU running. Uh, disable the hyper threading in their environment. Uh, and then uh, bind the memory locality so you're. So it's where you want it to be, all right? Uh, for Azure, premium storage, uh, but also go through and adjust your TCP idle timeout. Uh, the, the default that they use is not optimal. Uh, for VMware, again, handle the, the memory over commitment. And this is the one where we, we, I saw the most information about, you know, be careful about where it's throwing your stuff because VMware will move things around uh, pretty willy-nilly, but we need to go through and make sure we've got rack awareness so that it doesn't just throw all your nodes together on the same box again. We want to, we want to keep each of those separate. Uh, backups. OK, so if you've got you know, 100 shards, you get a little bit of data, right? Well, I mean, if it's 100 shards on Raspberry Pis, maybe not. But you know, in, in general, you get a lot of data. Uh, one of the reasons for running MongoDB is you can have that horizontal scale. You can put a lot of data in there and do a lot of things. When you do a backup, you're moving a lot of data. So what you might look at is, it, depending on how, how big your environment is, do some testing, but you might want to actually just have a Mongos that is dedicated to doing the backups. So that when you go and say, give me everything, it might still take a while to, to, sh to shove it all through that one box. It's probably not too bad. Backups, we expect to take a little while because they're moving everything. But you don't want that to interfere with the application servers. So if the backup is, is going to destroy a Mongos, let it destroy its own Mongos and let the application service continue working. Your MongoDs will be fine. They're used to, to handling lots of data, right? Um, well, hopefully. Right? It depends on how you're doing the backups, I suppose. <laughs> um, compactions. Uh, so what a compaction is in, in, in MongoDB, uh, we don't need as much for Wired Tiger. You do use, use a lot of MMAP. The mechanism that MongoDB does, uses for writing data to the, to the disk is it says, oh, I've got a file this size. I'm going to allocate a little bit more than that and then write the, data, the, the file to the, the record, the document to disk. Um, and then if that document expands, I can rewrite in the same place and it's using the same amount of space or whatever, right? And so it, it does that. But after you've had a bun bunch of churn, you end up with a bunch of wrong size document chunks on disk. And so basically, for compaction, you wipe out the data stuff and tell it to replay all the data from back from, from one of the other uh, uh, nodes. Um, but it's reading the op log, which is the log of all, you know, it, it, get, it goes and grabs, says, give me a copy of everything you have. But then you have, you've got new operations coming in, new writes coming into your database during the time. And that's the op log. 
But if you're in an environment where you have like one hour's worth of op logs, but it took you two hours to, to make a copy of the, of the shard, then you'll never be able to restore that node, right? So um, plan for what you need. We ran, actually ran into this with a, a customer last week where they had a shard that was just getting hammered in a time when they normally aren't doing very much. And so we, we, do our, we do these compactions during off hours for them. And they were doing a one-off thing that they had, it was actually our customer's customer doing it. They hadn't notified our customer, so our customer hadn't notified us. We would have said, okay, don't do compactions that day, right, if we'd known about it. Um, and uh, we had to do some other things to make sure that we could get that other node back up uh, with, with a, uh, uh, without, because we didn't have enough op log to, to finish the compaction. Um, so as a system administrator, though, <laughs> your DBA should be handling that, but they could be coming to you and go, why isn't this thing running fast enough? Well, let's remind them we need enough op log to actually do the job, right? Uh, and also, you're, you know, if you're a system admin, you're the one, one of the ones that's going to be getting pages. Let's, let's avoid that. Uh, security. So TLS. So we can use TLS for, for MongoDB between the Mongos, be, uh, you know, talking to the application server. Um, a lot of people think about that and go, oh, make sure we get, we got everything set up for our web server. But if you're setting up your, your Mongos your, or your Mongo replica set to also use TLS, which you should, uh, make sure you're monitoring the, the expiration on that one as well, right? Don't, don't worry about just the, the, uh, the web server. Let's or something like that that can, that can take place. Uh, SE Linux uh, causes MongoDB to segfault. It's awesome. Um, no, it causes the server-side JavaScript to segfault. So enable one or the other. Either enable SE Linux or enable server-side JavaScript. Your choice. Uh, connect tracked, I mentioned earlier. So if you're tracking uh, connections coming into your your database and doing some counts and some other things like that. Uh, IP tables is going to create uh, some tables of data for, the, for ke keeping track of all those connections. Um, and it is a pain to find that that's the problem if you don't know to think to look for that when, when you run out of resources because the, the application just stops working right. I found this out in a different application one day, <laughs> the hard way. Um, so make sure you go through and expand those to meet what you're going to need, what you're expecting to need under heavy load, right? So think about what, what is your busiest day of the year, right? If you're, if you're busy, the day, busiest day of the year is St. Patrick's Day. Your busiest day of the year is June 1st for whatever reason. Think about what your load is going to be on that particular day, all the different things you're going to get in, be getting. Think about what you're going to be getting if somebody also attacks you at the same time, right? And make sure you've got enough room in your in your tables for that. Uh, and uh, with an extra ooh in the MongoDB, uh, so it had an extra HTTP interface. Um, so if you're running an older version of MongoDB uh, as a sysadmin, also make sure you're looking at what the uh, the use of that other interface is and lock that down uh, as appropriate as well. And it's usually 1,000 above wherever you've got your MongoDB running. Uh, for a sharded instance in your firewalls, the Mongos will be talking to and from the client application servers. We've already talked about that. It's going to be your, your TLS endpoint for those. Uh, it's going to be talking back to and from the uh, MongoD shards. It's going to talk to every node on every shard. Um, it'll be talking to and from uh, other Mongos. I'm sorry, the question mark is, is extraneous. Uh, it'll be talking to and from your config servers. Now, for uh, for, for optimization and stuff, we don't have to care, worry about the config servers too much, but you do need to talk to them, so make sure your firewall allows talking to them, because otherwise the Mongos don't know who they are 
or what they're doing, what their purpose in life is. So we need to be able to talk to those Mongo servers, or the config servers. Um, and then uh, they talk to, uh, the, the MongoD talk to other MongoD in the replica set. Uh, and then, of course, you need to have access from your monitoring uh, and admin hosts, right? If your backup server can't talk to it, it won't be running backups. Um, and whatever you're monitoring, you should be monitoring it. Make sure that that can get to all the things you need. Uh, specifically, MongoStat is a very useful tool. It's, it's great, uh, but it talks to every single node and, and lots of the different Mongos. Um, so you want to make sure that your firewalling is allowing uh, those connections to come in. Uh, replicas at firewalls. Um, so your MongoDs need to talk to and from the application server. So in, in a replica set environment, you don't have the Mongos. Your MongoDs are, are doing everything. Um, so they, the, the clients, will, the applications will be talking to those. And you need to make sure you think, okay, they just, the, the, if they're just writing and reading from the primary, they only need to talk to that box. Well, any box in the, in, the cluster, in the replica set can be the primary at any given time, right? So it takes five to 12 seconds to change primaries, and they have elections just, they, ha they have elections for weirder reasons than the European parliaments, right? And it's like, ah, I've felt like it's Tuesday. Bob, it's Wednesday. Well, that's close enough, right? <laughs> no, it's, it, it's really stable, but... There's a lot of things going on in the back end where it might want to do a replica, uh, do a, an election, and you don't have, want, it, want services to have to wait on humans to notice it. You want things to keep running. Uh, so keep in mind on, on that. Uh, anytime we're talking about MongoD, we're talking about all of them because anyone can be a secondary, anyone can be a primary at any given time. Um, MongoD, talk to other MongoDB D in the replica set. And again, monitoring an admin host, you want, to be able, want them to be able to talk to them in order to find out what's going on in your environment. Tuned, Tundi, Tuned, I don't know how to pronounce it, um, is a new thing from, that RHEL has, as in like I think the, the last five years. I haven't looked at it. It's not something we run in our environment. Um, but it's, the goal of it is to detect what your load is on your, for your environment and automatically tune things for you. So in a MongoDB DB environment, it would say, oh, you're getting lots of TCP connections. We're going to go through and up those things. No, you're getting lots of disk I.O. We're going to try to go through and, and do stuff. It only tunes a couple of parameters at this point. Um, so for the most part, unless you're like wanting to experiment with it, which, I, which is probably a great idea, but for the most part, I would probably say just disable that in especially in production, and tune things manually. Uh, and then if you've played with it and you're seeing some really good results and you've done some extensive testing to find out what, happen what it does when you get a DOS, you know, type of thing, uh, then, then maybe go ahead and enable it. Uh, so I've got some thanks for, uh, for things. So one, thanks to MongoDB group, corporation, project, whatever else, uh, for the software that we use. Also, the core documentation. The MongoDB documentation is really good. Uh, I should have mentioned they've got MongoU. They've got free classes. Uh, I, I recommend them. They're really good. Uh, and you can, you, they're, you've got a week to do them, but you take them at your own pace, kind of. Um, also, Percona is a, uh, uh, I, I, come, I you know, come more from MySQL world, and they have lots of great MySQL documentation. But they also have some really good MongoDB documentation. Uh, so I recommend looking at that. I'll have links to actually uh, at least, I think, two of their articles. Uh, and then my DBAs, uh, I've, I've learned a lot from them. They gave me some feedback on this in an article I wrote, so I appreciate that. Uh, and again, to, to scale volunteers, I mean, every year I want to thank them because they do a lot of work to put on an awesome conference for us. Uh, but this year they definitely put in a lot of extra work uh, and, and a lot of it at the last minute. Uh, some resources. These are all links. If you go, when I, once I post these slides, you can, you can go follow the links. Uh, so Uni Unix Unlimit settings for MongoDB. Uh, some other stuff that uh, Tim Villancourt is a Percona document that, that was in there. Um, that was really good. And I think that's the last slide. So I'll go back to, oops, the, uh, yeah, how to get a hold of me if you want. Do we have any questions? No? Anything that I got massively wrong other than NUMA? No. <laughs> Anything else? No? 
Okay. Well, thank you. We have BOFs going on tonight, uh, starting now uh, for the next couple of hours. Also, tonight is game night. I think that starts in an hour. Uh, it's a really good uh, uh, setup that Lori does, um, and they usually have food at that. Uh, and then tomorrow, speaking of Lori, um, something that she's added this year is there's a, a jobs and career boff tomorrow, or boff, track tomorrow starting 11. That's over here in one of these rooms, I don't know which room, uh, where she looks like she's got some really cool stuff in. So if you're looking for a job or if you're looking to hire people, you might want to check that out tomorrow. All right. Thanks a lot and have a great night.